It's 2050, and the world as we knew it ended. The barracks, yeah, um, we were insulated from most of the worst. No one got here easily. It's 10 days hike. What we've tried to keep here is that memory of the best of human achievements. Global food supply was hit by a series of climate change induced droughts. People ran out of water, which caused riots in every major city. Looting, destruction, collapse. This guy saw it coming. And so we're taking shelter in a community he built here back in the 2020s. So that to me is the start of a dystopian fiction film, but you see that as an inevitability, do you? I'm not sure how it finishes, and I hope we're not all living in bunkers, um, but dystopia is coming for sure. Ben is one among an increasing number of climate doomers who believe that the end of the world is nigh. I spent a couple of days at his repurposed military barracks in an undisclosed location in Germany, where he's preparing for a world post-climate-induced collapse. We had some heated exchange. I find some comfort in thinking that we can change. And the tooth fair is real and so is Father Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Watching Ben prepare for a post-climate apocalypse world, I wonder, is he being absurd or are we? Ben Green probably awaits spring more than most, after getting through eight harsh German winter months with no heating and no company. He was kind enough to trust me with his lettuce. If ruined, it means Ben has no salad all year. Are you totally self-sufficient here then? This isn't an exercise in self-sufficiency. Yeah. The ultimate aim is nothing comes in, nothing goes out. Mm. It's just the consistency thing. What do you mean? Radical authenticity. What's that? Um, so if I'm trying to tell someone uh, my opinion on the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, yeah. they can't say, well, yeah, but you use a car in supermarkets. Mm -hmm. In his pursuit of authenticity, Ben doesn't own a car, is vegan and grows everything he eats right here. He even makes his own fertilizer. He says the biggest chinks in his armor, though, are three fat mangalitsa pigs that he rescued from early slaughter. Tony. Stop it, stop it. Yeah, I know you're playing, but you're not allowed to play with your mouth open. <laughs> it's scary. I probably shouldn't have rescued them. Why not? Because all of my money goes on pigs. Do they keep you company in the winter? I mean, they sleep mostly. Um, it is useful to have something you have to get out of bed for, because mm. it is easy to not get out of bed in the winter. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a slippery slope. It sounds like such a harsh <laughs> self-imposed lifestyle and I wanted to know what convinced him to dive in so deep. I guess I'm trying to get to the core of like what you're doing here. What is your kind of aim or message with this? Um, so it's changed over recent years. Um, originally it was um, to draw attention um, to the inevitability of collapse. Um, now that that inevitability has gone beyond a theoretical inevitability but it's already started and there's nothing at all that you can do to stop it, um, I'm now trying to um, be useful in the rebuilding that will also inevitably happen after we spend some time in collapse. Hold up, I'll come back to the rebuilding thing, but is collapse inevitable and is there nothing we can do? I put this to several leading scientists, including Inga Anderson, who is Under Secretary General of the UN, and Joel Gerges, who is the lead author of the latest IPCC report. You only have to really think about it in terms of just a simple medical analogy. So say, for example, a doctor said to you, look, we're really sorry to say you've got cancer. OK, are you going to throw up your hands and say, oh, there's nothing we can do. There's no treatment and I'm, we're all going to die anyway so I'm not going to do anything about it and you allow yourself to actually just deteriorate and the doctor hasn't said that at all all they've said is you've got cancer you know it's spreading there are going to be certain things we can say certain things we can't say but would you actually just immediately throw away all the options that we have and go to the worst possible scenario and say there's nothing we can do the latest IPCC report outlines what we can do and presents multiple scenarios so let's do a quick summary of where we are 
The Earth has already warmed by 1.1 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. Countries pledge to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees, aiming for 1.5 degrees. But current trends put us on track to cross 1.5 degrees in the next five years. Scientists still offer many other scenarios, though. In the IPCC, we have a range of different, you know, climate modelling scenarios ranging from low emission scenarios to really high emission scenarios and kind of everything in between. The higher you go, the worse things can get, especially as we could hit tipping points like thawing permafrost releasing methane or large forests dying off. But the higher end scenarios are unlikely. So while scientists argue that there's no scope for the apocalypse per se, it's important to acknowledge that in many parts of the world, some apocalypses are already happening. We are already seeing the Greenland ice sheet, ice sheet collapse. We are already seeing coral reef die-offs and we are already seeing ocean currents being altered, the northern forest, uh, the high forest changing. These kind of enormous climatic events and add to that the fires, uh, the heat waves, the floodings, etc., are real. You can't deny that. And so whether one wishes to call it doomerism or whether one wishes to call it a call to action and therefore take action, this is really up to us as humanity. Humanity has shown progress, some of which has been unexpected. CO2 emissions were not as high as predicted in 2022. Look, renewable energy is cheaper in most countries than hydrocarbon, than, than oil or coal, etc. based fuels. Now that's mind blowing, right? Look, um, nighttime storage is getting better and better. Or look at Morocco, made this massive investment in solar, by which they can actually export into the European Union. So I think that we have solutions abound. The IPCC says that we can still, in theory, keep warming to below 1.5 degrees with such action and other urgent and system-wide changes, including decarbonizing buildings and industries like steel and cement, and importantly, severely ramping up carbon capture technology. Ben does have a somewhat sceptical view on this. And I genuinely don't think that your IPCC scientists um, are communicating to you the same way they'll communicate to other people. But why do you think that is? Because you're a journalist. So? Well, because they've, they need to not spook the people. You know how deliberately cautious they are. Also, scientists are cautious people um, because they absolutely abhor the idea of saying 100% or 0%. I understand that people have fear about climate change. And I also understand that people um, sometimes misunderstand the science because it's actually quite complex science and it's nuanced. And it means that if you read it, it doesn't necessarily mean you understand it. But what I do share with this person is that, that the climate emergency that we face right now is very real and does require an extremely urgent response. The, the idea that we're going to act when we traditionally haven't is, to me, pure hokum. How long does it take the world governments or the world organisations, whatever it is, to agree on one way for us to make telephone calls between countries? I mean, it's like 20 years or something, was it? To, to end up with double O standard country code. So while the science leaves a window of possibilities, this I can get on board with. There has been a lot of lethargy and inaction from governments, promises repeatedly broken. While corporations and fossil fuel lobbies have been actively holding back the large scale changes that we need. Many of our videos are about this. So as a result, Ben decided to take this extreme position. It's where I feel useful and comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that if you're in a position in your life where it, there's a decision that's really obvious. Mm -hmm. But what, what made it seem really so obvious? Um, my, my life situation at the, at the time was um, I was single. Um, I had a, um, a small flat in Berlin, which I'd sold. Mm. Um, I got fired from my job and got a nice big compensatory payout. It was perfectly obvious that it was time to to do something with some meaning. Ben's experiment is not really what you would expect when you first hear someone prepping for the apocalypse. I pictured a lonely bunker with canned tomatoes, weapons and iodine tablets. 
and the anxious wait for Armageddon. In some ways, it's the opposite. I, I call it a research institute. Um, it's, an, it's a place where people can come and authentically think about um, a situation that is so far out with their own experience. His goal is to produce a manifesto for the people who might be rebuilding the world post-collapse, including notes on the best music and art out there. This is an extreme stance, but many, especially young people, do feel that the end of the world is nigh. In a poll conducted among 10,000 children around the world last year, over half believed that humanity is doomed, and the biggest reason they saw was government inaction. What are we doing when 65% of our young people think government is failing them? Caroline Hickman was one of the authors of the study resulting from the poll, and she's also one of the world's leading psychologists on climate anxiety. I spoke to her about this trend and what psychologists believe is happening. Think of a spectrum, a line. One end of your spectrum, one end of the line, is the apocalyptic, catastrophic, doom and gloom, absolute belief in that. The other end, far end, you've got naive optimism. It's okay. The government will save us. Technology will save us. Humans have dealt with problems before. We can deal with this one. The problem we have is that both of these opposite positions are the same thing. Because both of them are the human ego attempting to get back in control. The ego, the human ego, does not like uncertainty. She argues that feeling anxiety is a valid response at this time. We need to feel anxiety, depression, despair, rage, doom. We need to feel doom. That hopelessness, that helplessness. You just don't want to be stuck there. So I also then remember creativity, joy, connection, empathy, resilience, anger. You can carry that pain in your heart. You can carry it in the way you take care of your environment. And you can take small actions at a home level, but you can also take big actions at a planetary level. You can take political action and social action and personal action, and you just need a combination of them all. Research shows that taking care of your mental health and taking action on an individual and community level does improve your well-being. And these actions, whatever they are, lead to change. Ben is taking action, but I feel unsettled by the focus being so far into a dystopian future. I think it's like a very morbid approach also to just kind of like say, let's not get involved. Because, I mean, things, yeah, I agree that things are bad, but they can be so much worse and they could get so much worse. And I think that's where we have to like step in and prevent that instead of all just like, because the amount of suffering that we're going to experience until this collapse happens is enormous. Why are we not stepping in in this moment? Because it's physically impossible. Yes, we should be engaged, absolutely. Um, what's the cost of failure though? If you t were to motivate enough people strongly enough to actually come together and change something, and you knew that it was already too late, there is already too much carbon in the atmosphere, what's then the cost of essentially being dishonest with people and then failing? I think, yeah, absolutely you should be sp spending an awful lot of time in thinking about adapting. Um, and I. I know there are a lot of good people putting a lot of energy into that. Um, my stance is just to go one step further. The scientists I spoke to echoed the sentiment that it's not too late to take action and avert the worst or even the really bad. For me, this is the most profound moment in human history. We are going to look back at the 2020s and say to your kids or your grandchildren, where, where were you at that time? How did you show up? And you know, when we think sometimes about say the 1960s, that really revolutionary time in say the US history where, you know, there's all the civil rights and, 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 you know, gender equality. It was this moment where people had to step up and say, you know, are you going to be a racist? Or are you actually going to be someone that's taking a stand for equality in society? Really, it's profound. And, and, I, and, and the people alive today 
are effectively the people who are going to determine the future course of humanity. You have to face the truth. Things are really bad. So what we have to do is feel the tension of that and hold that position in the middle where we have multiple uncertainties and there is a lot we can do. I asked Ben how he would feel if collapse, as he sees it, is averted. I mean, I'm not going to feel that I've entirely wasted my life. Um, I'm also not going to feel that I contributed particularly to it. It's not, yay, the barracks saved the world. <laughs> Definitely not that. Um, I don't know, really. I don't know what I'll do. I think the only way for me to conceptualise an answer to that is to think of a magic carbon-sucking technology. Um, I need, to, I need to believe in that first. Right, OK, I believe in that. Um, I think I'll probably sell this place and go and do yoga on a beach. <laughs> it's a big and difficult thing to talk about the fate of humanity, but I've left this feeling like it's something we should be doing more because multiple scenarios do exist and many solutions are out there too. And the scenario that ends up playing out will be the one that we choose. So which one do you think it's gonna be? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to come back every Friday for more videos like this.